Some films were harmed in the making of this podcast. Hello and welcome back for another For Your Consideration, the podcast featuring roundtable discussions reevaluating the cinematic canon of past masterpieces and modern classics. I'm Mike Josek. And I'm Dustin Friesenan. Thanks for joining us. On today's show, we're going to be discussing Chris Marker's 1962 photo roman, La Jetée. A.K.A. that movie that shows you just how much better bedtime stories could have been with a soundtrack and better stories. Okay. <laughs> Now, just before we get into the episode proper, as I sit here recording with my esteemed co-host, Dustin, he is celebrating his 33rd birthday? 32nd. 32nd birthday. So, happy birthday, Dustin. And a very merry unbirthday to you. And if anybody else wants to show any birthday wishes to Dustin, feel free to comment on the site or just send money. Cash or check is preferred, but I will take gift cards. With that out of the way, let's transition to the credits for today's film. So La Jetée was directed by Chris Marker. It was produced by Anatole Jamal. Screenplay was by Chris Marker. It stars Hélène Châtelain, Davos Hanik, and Jacques Ledoux. It was narrated by Jean Negroni. Music was by Trevor Duncan. Cinematography by Chris Marker. It was edited by Jean Ravel. And it was released on February 16th of 1962 in France. And is generally considered one of the greatest sci-fi films of all time. Despite the fact that it's less of a film and more of a picture story, which is exactly how it's advertised at the beginning. A picture novel. It is currently ranked 50th in the critics' poll on Sight and Sound's Greatest Films of All Time. Dustin, how did you feel about this film? My first impressions were that it was definitely a much more unique experience since normally you expect movement and whatnot. Like, I've seen silent films... I've seen older films, but this is the first time I've seen something that was entirely a picture story. I've seen it done as little skits, but never as sort of a full-fledged movie. And a lot of it worked very well. Uh, One of the things that I particularly notice is that uh, I'm not too sure whether or not it necessarily happened. They say that, yes, he was traveling through time, but there's not really any indication that he did. You have him going through these sort of dream sequences where he's having all sorts of psychedelic experiences, which is what I'm going to call his uh, travels to the past, but he never comes back with any information that actually helps anyone. When he gets a hold of the people from the future, they say that, yeah, we can't really mess with this because we got to let things sort of happen organically. So in the end, all he does is he's fixating on this memory, right? That memory, he's effectively building upon it using whatever techniques they're giving him. I'm assuming some sort of drug, probably, since all he has is those coverings on his eyes. And he's just freaking out. And they chose him because, once again, he has these such these strong memories of his youth and seeing that woman on La Jetée. He sees her on the jetty, and this is like a very formative memory of his life. And I could easily see how he's sort of hallucinating or imagining or dreaming all these experiences based around this really strong memory that he has. The man who dies at the end who's supposed to be him, that once again could just be the point at which his mind breaks, much as it did for everybody else and their strong memories. If you're talking about strong memories, most of them might have their strongest memories as one of these kind of moments where somebody died, where the war began, where the bombs were dropped, and that's what stuck with them. And getting those drugs, I could see that creating that moment where they imagine themselves as that person who died, and they all had these same experiences, but they were unable to relay them because when they came back, they were driven insane. (laughs) I do think it's interesting that you bring up the possibility of it being uh, all in his head or a dream, because traditionally, if you look at any analysis of this film, most people take it at face value. I, I don't know if I've run across yet, just in my own research, anybody who's actually entertained the idea that none of this is actually happening, that happening, that this is all just essentially a dream. Well, he there's nothing from any of his experiences that affects anything in the modern day portion of his life. All you have is he meets this woman, 
throughout portions of her life and apparently she's okay with this guy who teleports in and out <laughs> but i think that's also part of what makes the movie so haunting and beautiful in its structure and its execution because i mean ultimately the conceit is that because he has that very fixed point in his past that's very clear to him there testing the time travel by sending him to that point and when they feel that he has achieved the ability to kind of latch on and and go to this point and be very specific about it they then sent him to the future for him to get information on how to save the people in his present and he comes back with the good excuse that oh we can't be fiddling around with the past <laughs> But then he ends up getting sent back because the people in the future contact him and say, hey, it's kind of cool that you can time travel just like us because we can do it too. And why don't uh, you come and hang out with us? And he's like, I'd rather go back with the woman in the past because that's kind of what he's drawn to and that's what he's romanticized and wants to live out. And he gets sent back, which of course is part of the whole loop that is the film. And it's kind of inevitable. Which is of course one of the few ways that time travel tends to be done right. Where when you go into the past, you can't change anything because that was all part of an already closed system. Other possibilities are the whole branching sort of multiverse theories and whatnot and this one treats it very well it does it very well especially since so many movies that came after it have done it so poorly <laughs> well it's not the first time travel paradox story but it is uh, not at all it is a very poignant one it's a particularly romantic one I think partly because of the way it's presented, it, it is kind of unique. The whole photo roman is... I mean, there's so many ways that you could look at this. The film itself plays with time travel as a conceit, and the film is presented in still images. You're looking at still images that are still playing sequentially as a film. So, I mean, even just from a structural standpoint, on a very technical level, the film is playing with time. And then you look at it narratively, and it's playing with time and then there's that moment in the film where uh, it's one brief moment where there's actual movement because he uses a motion picture camera to capture a very brief the the woman just is waking sort of, up just sort of laying there and that in, a, in and of itself is so impactful because it's something that you're not used to seeing you've grown accustomed to seeing the way this is presented with the still images and the sounds and then all of a sudden you have this moment with the very natural animal sounds, with her waking up, natural movement. And honestly, it feels to me like that is the point when he realizes that he's fallen for this woman, as opposed to just creepily time-stalking her. <laughs> it's also the moment, I think, where he feels that he's truly... He feels that he's truly able to exist in that moment with her, and then he loses it. It was shortly after that, I believe, that he went to the future and then wanted to go back to the past, and most of it ended around that point. There is a whole sort of underlying theme of inevitability and you can't escape your past and you can't escape your future. There's just every everything in this film seems to just really hammer that point home in a very sort of subtle way. This film works on you subconsciously. You're not watching it and going, oh, that is obviously the moment when this is supposed to be interpreted this way. And it, it's well edited. It's rhythmic. It's almost musical. And the way that haunting dreamlike soundtrack kind of plays over it and by doing it with narration and there is dialogue, but technically it's kind of muffled in the background and it's German because it's the German scientists who are the ones who are kind of planning and, and figuring out this whole time travel thing. I think also because it's such an organic way of time travel, it's done through drugs and just being really kind of focused mentally and having that moment in the past that's so alive in your memory. And I mean, the apparatus is technology of some kind, but it's not like hopping in H.G. Wells' time machine. It's not like Skynet sending you back. It's, it's getting in the most comfortable hammock ever created and having a nice little moment. <laughs> It also shows that you can do something very, very powerful and very, very effective with almost nothing. Oh, absolutely. This is something that I'd like to see more of. They had a very good story. The world that they built is very well done. And that's why it was turned into another good movie by uh, Terry Gilliam, 12 Monkeys, later on. But I do think the editing wasn't as good 
good as you say it is there were certain moments where they were focusing on some stills I feel too long and playing just some background sounds of like here's a plane coming down and those I actually felt dragged on a little bit longer than they than they could have like if if this is a picture story I would have skipped over some of those frames as I was reading it sort of deal as opposed to this is happening with a normal progression of time. Because it's a still, I can't help but think of it as me flipping through these stills to an extent, and where would I, as the reader, stop and go? But I did feel that the stills worked very well with the notion that he was having to hold on to a memory, a single point in time, because that's what a picture is. He's holding on to that memory of that woman's face at that exact moment, and that's what it is. Everything is just a bunch of moments, and time becomes irrelevant, because you can see those pictures in any order. I think what you're talking about with the planes and maybe the images lasting a little bit too long, for me that just feeds into what I was saying earlier about how the execution of this film plays with time. It just works on like a lot of different levels. Now, you may not be responding positively to how it's playing with time, but that's okay. <laughs> We're all going to respond differently. That's just going to happen. The point is, is that this movie, it engages you, it interacts with you, it it works, like I said, on almost a kind of subconscious level where it really, I mean, you ask questions. This is a, this is a story, this is a movie where it's told with so little, but I think you come out at the other end, at the very least, with a compelling story, and at best, a lot of questions. I mean, there's the question of, is this even real? Is he actually time traveling? There's the question of, you know, what caused the apocalypse? Apocalypse. I mean, it was World War III, but they don't really delve into it. There's a lot of stuff that they, they just sort of skim by, and you're okay with it. Well, that's not the point of the story. The apocalypse isn't the point of the story. The story is, it's a romance, as far as I'm concerned. And I'm also left at the end with the question of, in this loop, in this continual loop that is this man's life, he is faced with his own mortality, he witnesses his own death, he's trapped in this loop, but he's not the only one technically trapped in this loop, because there are other people. And, I mean, what is the woman thinking? as she's watching him being gunned down. She doesn't know that he's also watching this as a child, but, I mean, there's there's a lot of different players in this, and there's the whole, you know, people from his own time who, when he outlives his usefulness, decide to terminate him when he escapes. And, and they don't actually show what happens after his death in in his own time or what happens in the future it leaves a whole lot of possibilities open for what goes on with that obviously humanity finds a way to come back but there's no indication as to what that might be the story is the story of him and this woman and i also think it's kind of important to note that this is also a point about time uh it's a 28 minute film it is a short film it's one of the only it's the shortest film <laughs> in the top 50 of, of Sight and Sound's greatest films of all time. When we initially sort of set out to do this podcast and talk about movies, I think we almost qualified that one of our criteria was that we were going for feature films, and so anything kind of over 60 minutes. But, you know, even we've since kind of broken a lot of the, the original ideas of what we were going to use as a framework for looking at films and stuff and just... Just the way we've embraced sight I like, and sound. I like to think that we evolved in our in our thoughts and became more open to what film could be. <laughs> I think even if we were still being very rigid, I'd still want to include La Jete. It's it's such an incredibly influential movie. It's a very powerful movie and I don't think its length matters in that regard. As I said, I think it actually is a little bit too long. I would have cut maybe another minute or two of certain frames out of it, but it has a story to tell and it tells that story and it tells it well. And a lot of things, especially nowadays, have a problem with wanting to make things longer and longer and longer for money's sake, especially TV series. They will drag stuff out, and it's entirely unnecessary. There's something to be said for a nice... Efficient? A nice efficient story. <laughs> That's actually a good word for it. And also, I mean, as a short film, I've seen films that use still images before. I mean, a lot of the uh, experimental college films of George Lucas are this very thing. But the fact that this movie is still highly regarded, the fact that we're 50 years on and people are still putting it on these lists, the fact that it sort of stands head and shoulders above a lot of other films that are doing the same things that it's doing. It's really, it's transcending its form, I guess. It's refusing to be put in a box and it's saying hey I want to be counted among the big boys I really like this film <laughs> so I guess we'll move on to the judgment phase you can probably guess where things are going 
Dustin, what would be your final verdict on La Jete? Is it a masterpiece or a museum piece? La Jete is definitely a museum piece. Is it a masterpiece is the real question. It is a film worth looking at because it's not limited to what we view of as a film. It, as I said, it says it's a, it's a photo roman at the beginning. It doesn't even claim to be a film, but it's done in a, in a film fashion, and it's definitely unique in that perspective. The thing is, is it a masterpiece, or is the uniqueness the thing that's giving it a lot of points? And I'm honestly not too sure about that. I could easily see that if this was something that caught on, and there were hundreds of other films that you could see that were done in this style, that maybe this one would get pushed out. Out. But the story itself is very good. It does have a great world building. You don't know necessarily a whole heck of a lot about the characters because so much of what we do is learned through body language and the like, and you don't have that in a in a piece like this. Instead, all you have is what is effectively a pure story. You don't have anything that the any of the players say. You're told what they said, what they thought, and that gives it a whole brand of uniqueness and an sort of an art house sort of feel to it that's really hard to for me anyway call a masterpiece without having anything to compare it to and it really stands on its own in that regard but at the very least it is definitely a museum piece and it is something that is worth watching and something I would recommend to others to see regardless of whether or not uh, it was just for educational purposes or for interest's sake this is a film that I could show to a number of people and honestly it might be the short length which would allow me to do so <laughs> This is a tricky one. I will say that it is definitely a museum piece and almost leave it at that and leave others to to question what they would do with it. Well, I'm definitely going to fall on the side of Masterpiece. I think that while this film isn't unique, the fact that, like I said uh, a little bit earlier, it's still being talked about 50 years on, it still feels poignant, it still feels timeless. There's that time thing again. <laughs> it, it works on a lot of levels. It it just kind of it just stands out it just demands to be looked at thought about talked about and i think it deserves its position on the sight and sound list and i think everyone should watch this i think most people should watch it well anybody who's listening to this podcast <laughs> anybody who's listening to this podcast yes should watch it so that brings this episode to a close a slightly shorter episode but kind of fitting because it is the first and probably only short film we'll be talking about on the show i'm not going to go so far as to make that assumption but i will say it's probably going to be the shortest one for a while and what i can say is that it certainly has a hell of a lot more stories than our previous shortest film snow white this is true <laughs> the first three pictures had more story than snow white did touche If you have any thoughts on the film or the show, feel free to visit us on Facebook or on Twitter where we're at FYC Show. We're on Instagram. You can also find us on Stitcher and iHeartRadio. If you know anybody who picks up their podcasts off of those providers, let them know. Share the show. Spread the word. Feel free to rate and review us on iTunes if you pick up your show on iTunes. And subscribe if you haven't already. Please. And we are not the other for your consideration that has a different Mike with his wife. I am not Mike's wife. And with that, that's a wrap. I'm Mike. And I'm Dustin. We'll see you next time. Take care. Take care.